Hey guys, and welcome to Chem Squad Chemistry. This is Mr. Mullins again today. We are going to be continu continuing our discussion with Unit 6, talking about reaction types. So today we're going to cover two different types of reactions, that being single replacement and double replacement. We'll even talk a little bit about neutralization, which is a type of double replacement reaction. But we'll get there in just a little bit. So starting with a single replacement reaction, um, we have one given to us here. Sometimes they're given to you in the formula form. Other times they're given to you um, in the word and you're going to have to name them yourself. In this case, I gave you the formulas, and you need to be able to recognize this equation as a single replacement. So let's talk about how we do that. When we see these reactants, we notice that there is a copper, which is all by itself. We call this a free element. Um, meaning that it is, you know, it's not in a bond. You know, you could, you could consider this a metallic bond. It's just copper, um, but it's all by itself. And we also have a compound. So every single replacement reaction that you're going to see in chemistry one um, is going to start out this way, where you have a free element and a compound, and they're going to be making some type of new bond um, as the reaction goes on. So as you know, in a chemical reaction, that's where bonds are made and broken apart. So in order for us to make a new bond, we need to first break these apart. The way that I look at this is I see that um, copper is a cation typically when it makes a bond. We know that because it's a metal and all metals lose their electrons to form cations. Also in this compound I see that silver is the cation whereas nitrate is the anion. Remember cations are always written first so it's very easy to tell what they are in a, um, a bond. So we see here, who do you think that this copper, this free element here, is going to want to bond with? Is it going to want to bond with the silver, or is it going to want to bond with the nitrate? You probably know that positives don't attract each other. They actually repel. So this copper is going to be more attracted to this nitrate once the silver nitrate is broken apart. So that's what we're going to be seeing in this single replacement reaction, the breaking apart of the compound by the free element to create something new. So in this case, we're going to be having copper bonding with nitrate. Copper bonding with nitrate. And because this is an ionic bond, we're going to need to know the charges of the copper and the charges of the nitrate so that we can crisscross and show our new formula. In this case, copper is going to be a plus two. Remember with transition metals, we assume they are a plus two if it's not given to us. And in this situation, it wasn't. And we have memorized nitrate's charge of negative one. So when we crisscross, we end up with Cu1 NO3 to copper nitrate. So that's what's going to be made up here on our product side. You notice the only other thing that we've not used so far is the silver nitrate. I mean, I'm sorry, is the silver. So we're going to use the silver as well in our formula. So we're going to go ahead and write that over here plus silver. Now you have to ask yourself, is it all right for silver to be written this way? It is not part of Brinkelhoff. Hopefully you remember that. B R um, I-N-C-L-H-O-F. It's not part of Brinkelhoff, so it's not a diatomic. It's perfectly fine that way. For our last step, you need to make sure that every equation that you write from this point forward is balanced. Actually, from the other day forward is balanced, and this one is not. Remember um, how we balance. I'm going to balance a couple for you with you, um, but in just a few minutes, I'm going to balance them, and you're going to need to be able to do it. I assume you're good at balancing at this point. We notice there's one copper on each side, one silver on each side, one nitrate and two on this side. So I need to place a two in front of my silver nitrate, changing both of these to two, which forces me to put a two in front of the silver over here. So here would be my complete final answer for this single replacement reaction. Um, we are actually going to be doing the practices on page eight. So if you could turn to page eight in your unit book, um, that's where I'm going to be working from. So on page eight, we are going to start with example Roman numeral one. We see that that says Al plus PbNO3 two. We need to recognize this as a single replacement reaction because there is a free element and a compound. That's how we're going to recognize these every time. And they are going to be switching places. So they're going to be swapping partners. In this situation, let's go ahead and figure out what our cations and anions are. Obviously, it's easy for the compound because cations are always written first, so PBs are plus, nitrates are negative. 
Over here, aluminum, you see that it is a metal, although it's very close to the metalloids, it is a metal, so it's a cation. So in this compound, PbNO3 breaks up. Who's going, who is aluminum going to bond with? Is it going to bond with the lead or is it going to bond with the nitrate? Hopefully you recognize that positive and negatives attract, so that's going to be who the aluminum bonds with. So we know a little bit of side work here. Aluminum and nitrate are going to make a bond. That's an ionic bond, so we need to know the oxidation numbers or charges. We can use our periodic table to get the charge of aluminum. We see that it is in group three, so that means it gains, it loses three electrons, I'm sorry, um, to be a positive three. In nitrate, you have memorized its charge. So after we crisscross and reduce, we've got AlNO3-3. So that's going to be the compound that is created. We are also going to be left over with lead. Make sure you ask yourself, is it fine that lead is all by itself? The answer is yes, because it is not a diatomic. It is not part of Brinkelhoff. So here would be our equation before it is balanced. Remember, we always need to balance our equations. Um, we'll go ahead and balance this one with you too. So we've got AL, we've got PB, and we've got NO3. Looks like we've got one and one, one and one, two and three. We need to get our nitrates up to 6 by placing a 2 here and placing a 3 here and you see that our nitrates are at 6 but that unbalanced everything else so we need to place a 2 in front of aluminum and a 3 in front of lead. So there's our balance coefficients 2, 3, 2, 3. Let's go ahead and move on to example number 2. For example, number two on page eight, we see that we have Cl2 plus CuI2 and our yields arrow. So here um, we recognize again that this is a single replacement reaction. We know so because there is a free element. Just because Cl has a two with it does not mean it's not a free element. Um, it is only got the two because it's part of Brinkelhoff. And we have our compound, which is CuI2. So in this situation, nothing's different. We just want to label our cations and anions. Here we know that uh, you know the first thing written in a compound is always a cation, so the I is an anion. And we have Cl, which is in group seven, so it will form an anion when it bonds as well. So let's take a look at who do we think um, Cl is going to want to make a bond with after copper and iodine break up. It's going to want to bond with copper because positive and negatives attract. So a little bit of side work here. We have Cu and Cl. They are both going to want to bond together. Because it's an ionic bond, we need to know the charges. Copper, I mean, sorry, chlorine is a negative one. We know this because it's on the periodic table. Copper, however, gives us a little bit more work. We notice that copper is a transition metal. So how are we to know its charge? Well, it all comes back to this ionic formula, which I got from right here in the equation. We have to look at this formula and see if we can determine the charge of copper. This is no different than when we were doing ionic naming, and I would ask you, what's the name of this? And you would tell me it's copper iodide. I O D I. I misspelled that very bad, 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 very, very badly. But copper iodide, and um, then you would recognize that copper needs Roman numerals because it's a transition metal. So you have to uncrisscross the problem, right? Telling us that uh, copper actually has a minus two charge. So sometimes when you're not able to get the Roman numeral or to get the charge for a transition metal, you have to do a little bit of side work to figure out what its charge is. In this case, we're just going to uncrisscross I2 to find out that copper is a plus two charge. So with copper being a plus two charge and chlorine being a minus one charge, we get the formula CuCl2. All that's left over that we've not used is iodine, and iodine is part of Brinkelhoff, so it gets the I2. Finally, we need to make sure that our equation is balanced. We see that uh, oh, there's two chlorines, two iodines, and one copper, so this equation is balanced for you. Let's go ahead and work on example three. All right, so example three on page eight. Um, looks a little different. We notice that there is a polyatomic in this one, one that we've not learned, IO3, that's iodate, right? Remember, because anything that ends in oxygen is eight, that's iodide, so iodate. Um, it's just a polyatomic. Um, anyway, um, let's go ahead and decide what is our cations and anions. Again, we know that because these are in a compound, super easy. 
And silver is something we have the charge memorized. Silver is a plus one always, so we know it's a cation. So it looks like silver is going to be wanting to make a bond with this polyatomic. So a little bit of side work. We know that silver is a plus one charge from memory. But none of us know what IO3's charge is. And the reason for that is because you've never seen it before. So we have to figure out from the formula what is the charge of it. So this imaginary one belongs to the polyatomic where the two belongs to calcium. CA is a plus two where IO3 would be a minus one. So here's our answer that we want. It's going to be a minus one. So as we crisscross, we're going to get AgIO3. That's what's going to be made in this uh, single replacement reaction, AgIO3. AgIO3. And what's left over after that? Well, that's just calcium. Does calcium need A2 on it? Is it a diatomic? The answer is no because it is not part of Brinkelhoff, so it is not a diatomic. The last thing we need to do is make sure we are balanced. We balance this problem, this particular problem, by putting A2 in front of AgIO um, and A2 in front of AG. So now I'd like for you to practice some on your own. Page 8, 1 through 5 up there at the top. Um, that is going to be the work that you need to complete to become better at this. I'm going to give you a few minutes if you would pause the video now and work out problems 1 through 5 and I'm going to do problems 1 and 2 for you so you can see if you got them right. So if you've not finished it yet, pause the video. In this single replacement equation, um, Zn plus CuSO4, that's zinc plus copper sulfate, we need to figure out what our cations and our anions are. We know that zinc is a positive charge. As a matter of fact, it's a positive 2. We have that memorized. Um, we know that copper's a cation and sulfur's an anion. We see that this zinc is going to be attracted to the sulfate, so we have to do a little bit of side work. right? You should have memorized that sulfate is a negative 2. The reason the 2 is not shown above in this equation is because copper is also a 2, so they had been reduced. So here we're going to also have to reduce. We've got SO4, 2, um, and then it reduces to ZnSO4. So there's our compound that we're going to create, ZnSO4. And we also have copper. Now we've got to make sure copper is not a diatomic. It's not because it's not part of Brinkelhoff. So here you have it, your equation. Now make sure that uh, it's balanced, and in this case it is. So there you go. Number one on page eight. Number two on page eight is a little uh, more difficult. We've got uh, Cl2, Cl2 plus Ki, potassium iodide. And um, we need to figure out our cations and anions. Obviously here in the um, formula, I mean in the compound, it's positive and negative, where chlorine would be a negative, meaning it's going to be attracted to K. So potassium and chlorine are going to make a bond. We know that potassium is a positive 1 because it's in group 1, whereas a Cl is a negative 1 because it's in group 7. So we get KCl is going to be our compound. KCl with iodine left over. Now you notice that iodine is part of Brinkelhoff, so that means that it's a diatomic and we need to put a 2 subscript on it showing 2 iodines, which makes us need to balance our problem. But no worries at this point, you're probably really good at balancing and um, you just put 2 and 2. So there would be our final answer for number 2. If you need any more help with this, please come see Ms. Spivey or myself. This is called single replacement reactions. We're going to go ahead and move on to the double replacement reaction. So next up we have a double replacement reaction. As you can imagine, a double replacement reaction and a single replacement reaction are very similar, except in this case we're going to have our cations um, and anions both being replaced. There's not going to be any free element. As you notice here in both of these, in this equation, there is two compounds as our reactants, no free element. So we recognize this as a double replacement equation because there are two compounds and you notice that their products have completely switched places. They are no longer with um, the cation they are originally with or with the anion they are originally with. It's like going to a date with your date and then leaving with someone else's date. It's kind of weird to think about, but it's true. Um, so here we are going to do the exact same thing. We're going to determine who is our cations, who is our anions, and, and what's happening. And, and we'll see that in a practice problem in just one second. So if you have a place to write something down, we're going to be doing the practice problem in a Cl plus H2SO4. 
We recognize this as a double replacement reaction, again, because it's two compounds. There's no free elements. We need to decide who is our cations and anions. It's pretty simple since they're both in um, compounds. We know that the cation's always written first, so it's just like this. In this situation, Na cannot be attracted to Cl on the product side, or no reaction would take place, so it's going to be attracted to sulfate. So let's go ahead and take care of that. We know that Na and SO4 are going to be making a bond. Because they're making a bond, we need their charges. Sodium is in group 1, so therefore it's a positive 1. And you have sulfate memorized, it's a negative 2. After we crisscross, we're going to get Na2SO4. So our first compound has been created. All that we have left is our other cation. It's going to be attracted to our other anion. In this situation, we know that H and Cl are going to make a bond. We know that H is a positive one because it's in group one. We know that Cl is a negative one because it's in group seven. So we're going to crisscross and reduce and we get HCl, HCl. So from this, we have used our cations and our anions from both sides. Lastly, we need to um, balance our equation. So here we have um, a two is going to go here and a two is going to go here. I'm going to let you balance those on your own because I'm sure you're getting good at them. So that is a simple double replacement equation. Now it's not always so simple to get these oxidation numbers. Sometimes you have to uncrisscross what you're given and we're going to do that on the next problem. My next trick, I'm going to do example four on page eight, the same page we were doing our single replacement on, just at the bottom, example IV, where we have ALBR3, and that is in a reaction with NaOH. You guys should already be good at naming these, so let's go ahead and name them. ALBR3, that would be aluminum bromide, and NaOH, that would be sodium hydroxide. So um, here, it's a double replacement reaction because there's two compounds. So we're going to start off the same way as doing our positives and negatives. We see that aluminum is going to be attracted to hydroxide. So aluminum and hydroxide. Um, and we also see that Na is going to be attracted to Br. So we're going to have Na and Br. Because these things are making bonds, we need to know their charges. Um, there's two ways to get the charges. You can either uncrisscross the reactants like this. We have AlBr3. This 3 belongs to aluminum, so we know aluminum is a plus 3. Um, whereas this 1 belongs to bromine. That tells me bromine is a minus 1. Um, we also see with NaOH that there are imaginary 1s here that we don't write. So that shows us Na is a plus 1. Right? It goes up here. And it shows us OH is a negative 1. Right? So it tells us OH negative 1 and Na plus 1. So you can simply um, you know, uncrisscross your problems like we've practiced doing thousands of times now, or you can get them off the periodic table. Aluminum is in group 3, so it tells you it's got a plus 3 charge. So we're going to get ALOH3. So that's going to be our first thing made. You notice how I'm always writing my cation first. And over here we're going to get NABR, so plus NABR. So there it is for that one. We have finally written our equation. Now it's just back to the things that you already know how to do, which is balancing. So if you want to go ahead and pause the video and try to balance this equation, it is a little more difficult than the ones that we've been doing in the past. So pause the video now and balance the equation. All right, now that you have balanced the equation, um, I'll show it to you. We are going to need a three in front of NaOH and a three in front of NaBr pretty simple. All right, we are going to work example five and six on this same page. For example five on this page, we're given BaCl2. What's the name of that? Barium chloride. And we're given K2SO4. What's the name of that? Potassium sulfate. So let's go ahead and get started by labeling our cations and anions. We can see that barium is going to be attracted to sulfate. So we've got barium we've got sulfate. You should memorize sulfate's charge. Barium, you can either uncrisscross the 2 on the Cl, or you can look on the periodic table. It's a plus 2. So we are going to crisscross and reduce. We're going to get BaSO4. We're also going to do our potassium and our chlorine. So we've got K and Cl. K is a positive 1, where Cl is a minus 1. You can uncrisscross that or get it off the periodic table. So we've got KCl. KCl. 
And then you simply just need to balance your equation. This one's a super easy balance. We're just going to place a 2 in front of KCL. If you would go ahead and pause the video and try example 6, and then I will do it for you. So at this time, pause the video and try example 6. All right, so um, number 6 appears to be, our example 6 appears to be difficult because there's some polyatomics, but don't worry about them. We're just going to label our cations and anions like we always have, and we see that ammonium is going to pair up with acetate. So you should have both of these memorized, ammonium is plus 1, and acetate is minus 1. So when we crisscross and reduce, we're just going to get ammonium acetate straight up because they are both um, have a charge of 1. We also see that lithium is going to be bonding with sulfur. Lithium is a plus 1. We get that off the periodic table, plus 1. And sulfur is a minus 2. We get that off the periodic table. So we end up with Li2S. Running out of room over here. Finally, we just need to, um, you know, draw our coefficients to show that it is balanced. We need to place a 2 in front of um, am ammonium acetate, and we also need to place a 2 in front of lithium acetate, and that would be the end. So if you could work on numbers 6 through 10, and if you need anything, please come Ms. Sp see Miss Spivey, Miss Bennett, or myself, and we will uh, help you with these problems. Don't forget that you have a test coming up soon this week. That is going to be all for today. Uh, Mr. Mullins out.